Um, yeah, you know, I went through the talk and from 10 years ago, and I have to say, probably about at least 50% of what I'm going to say is new. So there have been some developments. Um, and I'm going to try and give you the best I can what's more scientifically based versus just what we you know, used to say, oh, runners should do, that's more myth. So we'll try and separate myth from fact. Uh, this is what I put up 10 years ago, which is what I call the big six, the six most common running injuries. And this accounts for at least 90% of what comes into my clinic. So I think if we go through this, we'll hit most of things. And whatever we don't cover, we can address with the questions. The first one I see a lot of um, is a hamstring injury. Um, it's more of an overuse injury. It's not the kind of hamstring injury you see more in football players where it goes real quick. It comes on over time. Um, and it can be mistaken for other things. It typically is not so much hamstring pain as it's lower buttock pain. And it typically is worse when you run faster. And what we'll see if we were to obtain something like an MRI, and we don't always need to do that, and this is true for virtually all tendon injuries, you can see any a spectrum of injury, and that might be just inflammation around the tendon. Uh, you may get tendon degeneration. That's called tendinosis, where you get thickening and scar tissue in the tendon. Or you may actually get a partial tear of the tendon. The other thing, though, that's unique <coughs> to this particular injury is that uh, a lot of times you'll get adhesions of the sciatic, to the sciatic nerve. And this is the uh, hamstring tendon inserting onto this bone here, the ischial tuberosity. And the tendon's thicker than the other side. There's a little of inflammation around it. But this is a sciatic nerve that's running right next to it. And that's why this injury can be exquisitely painful. And, and that's because the sciatic nerve can also get inflamed. They've done studies on patients who've actually gone to surgery for this. And this is comparing uh, somebody who has the condition versus somebody who doesn't. So this is normal tendon pathology. And you can see how the collagen fibrils are nicely aligned. This is somebody with what we would call tendinopathy. That's not even a tear. And so the collagen fibrils become disorganized. And therefore, that tissue is not as strong as it needs to be. So the goal of the therapy uh, is to try and realign those fibrils and restore normal strength. Biomechanically, um, most hamstring injuries occur during what's called the late swing or early <laughs> stance phase. So essentially, right before your leg is landing on the ground. And what needs to happen at that point is the hamstrings are in a lengthened position. They're absorbing energy, and they're preparing your foot for contact on the ground. So they're actually lengthening as they contract. And that's when they're working the hardest, but they're also the most in the most vulnerable position for injury. And the reason I point that out is to get your hamstrings stronger, you don't need, it's more important to strengthen them what we call eccentrically. You need to do exercises where you're stressing the hamstring as it's going through a lengthened position. It's not enough to just do like a hamstring curl in the gym where the muscle shortens because that's not getting it strong. That's concentric, but you need to also get it strong eccentrically. And we'll, get, we'll give examples of those. So the goal of therapy for this condition is progressive eccentric hamstring strengthening. And we're not going to jump into the eccentric component of this initially because that is the most demanding. And a few principles, and this is for all the exercise programs I'll talk about, but you want to take somebody from a non-weight-bearing position to weight-bearing and to more what we call functional exercises, things that more simulate the kind of activity you're going to do. And to break it down even further, and I just put this up in case some physical therapist came. Um, so don't, don't worry too much about it. But you want to go from various phases of static to more dynamic to even what are called plyometrics, more bounding types of movements. These are just some examples of exercises, not the only way to get this injury better. But just to give you an example, it's probably some things you guys are already doing in the gym. Um, this would be a single leg bridge or a double leg bridge. You can just hold it isometrically. You could then progress to something more challenging with, on one leg. Uh, you can do these ball curls. And so as you bring the ball in, that's concentric, hamstring shortening as it contracts. As you bring the ball out, and so that would be this one, now the muscle's lengthening as it contracts. And you can see what great form she has. So she's really 
controlling also throughout her core region as she does that exercise. She's not letting that drop down. You can progress this even further. And again, not everybody has to progress to this level. Um, but some of our, our more advanced athletes are going to want this challenge. You can do a single leg ball curl. Now we're going to get them upright in a more functional position. You can start with a double leg squat, single leg squat. Now you're reaching down, controlling your, your uh, leg position as you uh, try and reach for something. You can even put a weight in your arm as you do that. And that's going to work the muscle more eccentrically. Once you can do that and you're not having pain, then you know you're ready to start back to some type of running. Now, there has been some interesting studies that uh, I just want to mention. One was uh, all the way back in 2004, and I mentioned this last time. But it showed a significant reduction in injury recurrence when core exercises were added to the standard sort of stretching and strengthening. And you might ask, well, why is that the case? And this same group, then a couple years later, came up with a neuromuscular model to try and understand this. And what they showed is that if you can control the lumbopelvic region, uh, basically what you're trying to do, and I'll step away from the podium for now, but if, the, if you, you want to prevent your pelvis from going into what's called an anterior tilt, when that happens, particularly when you're fatigued at the end of a long run, it changes where the hamstring attachment is. So it, it basically lengthens that, and that puts more traction on the hamstring. So the idea is if you can keep your pelvis in a more neutral position by adding some of these core exercises so you have the strength to do that, it actually keeps your hamstrings in a safer po length position. Is that making sense? OK. So these are just a couple examples of core exercises. Um, I've got a whole article that I wrote for um, the uh, USA Track and Field Runners on a whole program, if you wanted to reference that, and of different types of core exercises and a progression there. Now, the question comes, what do you do if you do all this and you're just not getting better? And that's where we do a lot with different types of injections. And that's probably been one of the biggest advancements in the non-surgical field over the past 10 years, is we're doing a lot more with very selective types of injections in the area of injury um, if it's failing to respond to standard therapies. And this is where, under ultrasound guidance, we'll bathe the hamstring with a little bit of corticosteroid solution to try and, try and decrease that peritendinous inflammation. Now, you, the reason we use ultrasound, though, is because the anatomy around there gets pretty tricky. You've got the sciatic nerve. You've got a lot of important vessels. And so you really do have to know what you're doing. Um, using the ultrasound machine allows us to be very specific. We don't go in the tendon. We go around it. We avoid the sciatic nerve. Um, and our results have been, if, I would have to say, been pretty reasonable. Um, we actually published those uh, a few years back in 2010. And about 50% of the patients obtained at least moderate or complete resolution of their symptoms, which is, is not bad. Um, another quarter obtained at least mild resolution. And a quarter patients had one month to six months of relief and another quarter greater than six months. Now, the question that, that comes up, there's a new technique out there, and I don't know if you've heard about it, called platelet-rich plasma. And so whether we should be doing that now instead of corticosteroids. So at least now we've got some data on the corticosteroids and we can compare PRP to. Uh, unfortunately, there's only been one study to date um, that's been published using PRP for hamstring injuries. And it wasn't a very good study. Um, so it's hard to really compare. We're, we're doing one now, but we still haven't need to get more patients to, to really know if it's better than doing corticosteroid. Um, and I won't go into the details of this study, just to say that it really wasn't a, a good enough study for us to be able to say, is, is PRP better? Um, PRP does show promise, though. And, and what you're really doing is you take some of your own blood and you separate out the pla platelet-rich poor plasma from the platelet-rich plasma from packed red blood cells. And then we just take just that concentrate of the platelet-rich plasma. And 
that actually has these alpha granules that have your body's own natural growth factors. And it has PDGF, TGF, EGF, basically all these things stimulate stem cells, collagen production, uh, blood flow into the area, angiogenesis. Um, so the idea is to then stimulate your body's own natural healing system. By doing that, we inject now into the tendon, into that area of that disorganized collagen. So whether that's better, it seems promising, seems like it should work. Uh, there have been some good studies for things like tennis elbow, but we still don't know if it really will work better for this particular injury. Now, once somebody has progressed through the exercises, they are pain-free, whether or not we've had to do an injection, uh, and we want to get them back to running, we want to make sure the range of motion is equal to the other limb. We want to make sure they have, uh, are pain-free, putting them through different strength tests. A little bit of weakness is okay, uh, but you want to make sure they're at least 90% back to normal. And then we gradually get them back, gradually increase their mileage, their pace, gradually get them back to hill work. Um, keep in mind, though, that downhill running is actually a lot more stressful than uphill running. So that's probably the last thing you'd want to add back. Um, so we can go into this more detail later, but I do want to move on to one of my favorite topics, which is uh, patellofemoral pain. Or a lot of people call this runner's knee. And this accounts for 25% of knee injuries that I'll see in uh, my sports medicine clinic and is seen uh, in most sports medicine clinics. Uh, so it's extremely common. And what's interesting is that it's even more common in women. So females are two times more likely to develop patellofemoral pain than males. And it used to be we thought, it, you know, if we just gave you a few exercises, most people are going to get better. But what we're realizing with this condition, it's, it's kind of like low back pain. Once you have it, there's a good chance you're going to have it the rest of your life. Now, you may be able to keep it under control doing your exercises, but it may not go away completely um, because a lot of patients continue to have symptoms even though they've done all the different treatments. And we uh, analyzed some of this for a grant we put together, and these are very conservative data. So in 2008 alone, and this was looking at just 20 million patients, whereas by comparison, there were 230 million people in the U.S. at that time. So just analyzing 20 million uh, patients in the U.S., $8.3 billion was spent on this condition. So it really is a pretty major health problem. And that's why we need to come up with some better treatment uh, strategies for this. Um, I've been very fortunate at Stanford to be part of a multidisciplinary research group uh, working with our bioengineers, our mechanical engineers, radiologists, uh, to try and better understand this condition. One of the first things we wanted to do was understand why patients even get pain from this, because people never really understood that. One thing we found, and this is a fancy slide looking at different stress gradients within the cartilage, but we found that patients who have patellofemoral pain have increased stress in the, their patellofemoral joint and actually within the cartilage. And interestingly, p females actually had greater stress than males did. Now, there's different reasons why that can happen. And this is where it gets really complicated with this condition. Um, because here's patients with patellofemoral pain, and there's all kinds of things that can contribute to that increased stress in the cartilage. Uh, it can be from abnormal structural alignment, uh, the position of the patella, the timing of what's called the vastus medialis, one of your quadriceps muscles, a tight IT band, uh, that's one of the lateral structures that runs along your leg, abnormal foot mechanics, such as too much pronation, or poor pelvic control or pelvic mechanics. And so when somebody comes in with this, we really need to tease out where their de particular deficit is and then try and address their therapy accordingly. This is a, a fancy MRI scanner that uh, we have at Stanford, really just for research purposes. But what, what's unique about it is we were actually able to let somebody do a, a, a real-time squat and look at their knee mechanics as they go up and down through a squat. Now, unfortunately, this machine broke, and it was too expensive to fix. <laughs> but, um, but it did give us some useful information. 
We're now using CT scan to give us similar information. But, um, so patients would actually stand upright in this, and they could go through a different uh, a squat. In real time, we could see what was going on with the patella. And this is um, a, a, a cut through the knee. So if you can imagine, somebody's lying on the table, and you're doing like salami slices through their knee. And so this is the femur bone, and this is the patella lying on top of the femur. And this is the groove where the patella sits. And if you look here, it looks like the patella is nicely aligned. And you look over here and you say, well, the, geez, the patella looks like it's really out of alignment. It's what we would call subluxed. And this is many years ago, uh, one of my colleagues uh, that I was doing this research with, uh, Chris Powers from USC, we were looking at this and looking at it, and it didn't make sense to us. And it was just one of those kind of aha moments you have, one of the few I've had in my career, but this was really amazing, um, where you look at it and you look, oh, oh, you know, it was different than what we thought. The patella wasn't moving. What was happening is that the femur was moving on the patella. So it was really coming from the pelvis. And we'll get into this in more detail so you understand it better. Um, so the femur was internally rotating and the patella, in, retro, in comparison, was out of, uh, out of alignment. And these findings were uh, different between non-weight-bearing and weight-bearing. So in weight-bearing position, in a more functional position, they got even worse. And this is just to give you an idea of what really happens uh, with this. So this is a patient with patellofemoral pain. And look what's going on with the pelvis. And then look, look what happens then at the knee. And see how that femur's twisting in. And then the knee's going all over the place. So this really changed everything, because instead of just focusing on what's going on at the knee, we said, we really need to be strengthening patients at their hip to control that femur motion. Um, and so our treatment approach really changed. And this is a whole algorithm of how we put patients uh, through that. But what I want to really emphasize, as opposed to the details here, I don't want to get lost in this slide, is really um, our findings were then confirmed with a lot of other studies that uh, were subsequently done showing that, in fact, most patients with patellofemoral pain, particularly the females, had weakness in their hip muscles. And they had strength deficits in their hip abductors, the extensors, and the external rotators. Um, and that was pretty consistent. Study after study came out confirming these findings. And another study came out that, that was even more unique um, out of my colleague Chris Powers' group out of USC. And they looked at strength uh, evaluating it isometrically, or what's called isokinetic or isotonic. And isotonic's where you're looking more at the endurance of the muscle. And if we look at that, I just want to bring your attention here. The deficits were really most profound in the endurance of the muscle. And so, it, particularly for runners, it may not be enough just to get your muscles strong where let's say you can do 12 repetitions of an exercise uh, and you feel like you're strong. You really need to build up that endurance of the muscle because think about it, when you're out on a run and you fatigue, everything can change. And there's a nice study that confirmed this. They actually looked at weakness in these hip muscles in runners as they went out for a run at the beginning of the run during and after and found that the hip muscles progressively gave out and this led to those faulty mechanics that I showed on that video before. So you may look great when you start off, you may look great in the gym, but unless you build up that endurance, it may not hold up. So that's why I'll tell runners, if you really want to build up that endurance, you need to build up to where you're doing a couple sets of 20, 30 repetitions of these exercises. So you don't need the big weights but you really need to build up the endurance. And there have been a lot of studies then, then you know, looking at 
the outcomes following hip strengthening. So does that really change your mechanics? Um, and this just gives you a progression of how we might take somebody through a strengthening program um, from sidelining exercise to strengthen the uh, hip abductors. This is one for the hip extensors, another one for the hip adductors, but now more in a standing position. This is another good one for the hip abductors or uh, one of the most important hip adductors is the gluteus medius, another good one for that. Again, the extensors. And then finally, we might take them to something like a jumping exercise, what are called plyometrics, when you jump and you try and land really solidly. Um, but that's the last thing you want to do. If you start off with something like plyometrics, you're definitely going to get injured. Uh, and you may not even need that for your level of activity. Um, that really is something that uh, we usually only do in our pretty high-level athletes. So if you can handle it, great, but certainly don't start with it and don't think you have to progress to something like that. But there have been a lot of studies now looking at the effect of hip muscle strengthening on patellofemoral pain. Uh, various intervention studies, some really good randomized controlled trials. And just to summarize, what these studies have found is that a program focused on hip strength and exercises reduces runner's pain, improves their strength, but it also reduces uh, these what are called frontal plane movements. So basically, it keeps that knee from the femur from going into internal rotation and altering that alignment of the patellofemoral joint. Now, this was another study though that I found very interesting and they looked at runners who had these deficits, so they went into that femoral increased uh, internal rotation and adduction, um, so they were weak in their hip muscles, and they had them do various exercises. Um, so they had them do various squat exercises, and they found that after doing those exercises in the gym, they could correct everything. So they, uh, their mechanics then look, return to normal, so they can control that hip motion. But when they put them back to running, nothing changed. So again, it's not just enough to be able to do the exercise in the gym, you need to be able to take it back to your activity. So that's where you wanna make sure you've got somebody who can watch you run, maybe a coach, a good running buddy, um, or you can do something like run on a treadmill and have a mirror in front. And this study was done um, by Irene Davis, who's now at the Harvard Running Center. And she had patients uh, do this, what she called mirror feedback training. Uh, and they would watch themselves run and she would tell them to keep your knees apart, um, think about activating your, your gluteal muscles when you run, and over a four-week period, they were able to correct from this pre-form to this post-form. So they're really able to correct those mechanics. So that's really the final step. So you want to you know, get stronger, increase the endurance, and then take it back to your activity and make sure your mechanics are really corrected. Now, one other thing that's really interesting about this is you know, there's all this wave, should we change the way we land? Um, you know, should everybody become more of a forefoot runner versus a heel striker? Um, and we don't recommend that necessarily for everybody, but if you do have patellofemoral pain, this might be a way to decrease the force on the patellofemoral joint. Um, Dr. Davis's group also found that by going to a forefoot strike pattern, it did reduce peak forces and rates of loading on the patellofemoral joint and that was associated with the reduced patellofemoral pain. So something to think about, um, and we'll go into this later because it also applies to uh, other types of injuries. And, and just a little plug, uh, we do have a research study going on. I've got flyers out here, but we've got a new study going on uh, for patients with chronic patellofemoral pain where you know, you've tried all the therapy, you've tried everything, you still have pain, um, and we're actually using, believe it or not, botulinum, uh, Botox, uh, for this. Uh, and the theory there is that one of the, 
problems with this condition, if you go back to this slide, people talk about the poor VMO timing. This is one of your inner quadriceps muscles. And the idea is that your outer quadriceps muscles overpower your inner quadriceps. And for years, we focused on trying to strengthen those inner quadriceps muscles in therapy. But sometimes that's hard to do. And so there's a group out of Australia that started injecting this botulinum toxin into the outer quadriceps muscle. And by temporarily, temporarily weakening that muscle, it then gives the inner quadriceps muscle a chance to regain its strength, and you then get a better muscle balance. And their results were really promising. So we met with that group, um, and we're trying to replicate what they did, but also add some things, trying to tease out is there a certain subgroups of patients with patellofemoral pain who will probably respond even better to this than other subgroups, so then we can be more specific in our treatments. So if anybody's interested, if you're between the ages of 18 and 40, never had surgery, uh, let us know. Uh, may even get rid of a few wrinkles with it. So. <laughs> Uh, then moving down again, uh, still another knee injury is iliotibial band syndrome. And uh, this is the most common cause of lateral knee pain in runners. And I have to say, when I first started taking over the Stanford track team over 20 years ago, this injury gave us more trouble than anything else. And so I got really interested in it because it seems like a very simple injury, something that shouldn't disable you, uh, but we just had a lot of difficulty with it. And the reason patients get uh, problems with this is your IT band is this thick connective tissue sheath. So your uh, gl gluteal muscles, particularly the gluteus max, and then the tensor fasciolata form this thick connective tissue sheath, crosses your hip muscle, crosses your knee right here. And as your knee goes from a flex position to an extended position, it can rub against this bone here. It, what we call impinges against it. Uh, particularly as your foot lands at about 30 degrees of knee flexion. And over time, that can create inflammation and then pain. So there have been studies to look at this, and the bottom line is they found similar things to patellofemoral pain, that it really comes down to what's going on at the hip. And the mechanics are a little bit different between males and females. I, I don't think it makes sense to go into that kind of detail tonight. But the bottom line is the recommendation is to work on the coordination and timing of the hip muscles to control that knee motion. So very similar to what we were just talking about. And this study actually found that these kinematic differences, so these uh, alterations in the, the hip mechanics to lead to the knee problem actually causes greater strain on the IT band, and that's probably why it starts to overwork, and it impinges, and then becomes painful. So when patients come in with this, the first things we do, once we get them through the sort of the initial pain, um, and that may take a little while with different anti-inflammatories or icing, things like that, we'll start some stretching exercises. Uh, they can do uh, their own massage with a foam roll. Or you can even do what's called myofascial therapy, which is just specialized massage. This is a study we did uh, back in our, our uh, uh, human motion lab just to try and figure out what was the best stretch for the IT band. Um, and this is actually one of our former runners, J.J. White, and he did this for his uh, honors thesis when he was an undergrad here. And we compared this standard IT band stretch to one where you brought your arm overhead and then to where he went into more of a sort of a diagonal position. You have to be pretty flexible for this one in your hamstrings to get into that. Uh, but what we did find is uh, the best stretch was definitely this one, uh, and then probably second this one. Uh, but they were both much better than just the, this one. And then you can add on this foam roll, which is really simple to do. Um, in fact, my wife and I actually wrote a book on this. She's over there on <laughs> um, using the foam roll for different uh, conditions. But it's just something really simple you can do on your own. Um, I, I actually keep one in my living room. She keeps moving it. I keep moving it back. <laughs> so, um, but I really, I, my IT band, just the nature of my alignment, uh, it's always tight. So I, I really have to stretch it every night, and I'm using the foam roll with some stretches to keep, keep things under control. 
Uh, but it's a simple way to do your own massage, basically. Um, now, for real tough cases, you need to go to somebody who's really skilled at myofascial release or this really deep type of massage. And what we found is that patients with this condition, they get these trigger points or these constrictions in the muscle. Um, it can be up in uh, the gluteus minimus up here, one of the outer hip muscles. It can be uh, the vastus lateralis, one of the outer quadricep muscles, um, along the IT band itself, and then even in the posterior uh, biceps femoris, one of the hamstring muscles. And you have to systematically work through these. And until you work through all those restrictions, um, we found that in these tough cases, at least, patients don't seem to get better. But once you can free that up, they start to at least feel better. Now, if they're really not getting better, that's again where we might think about one of these injections. Uh, and it, we use ultrasound guidance again. We're taking a real tiny needle and just putting it right to the area where there's a lot of inflammation, trying to calm that down. And then they can start to get back to the therapy. But eventually, the goal comes down to a strengthening program. Um, and very similar to what we talked about before with the telephemoral pain, one of the main things you want to do is strengthen the hip abductors. And there's a systematic way to do this. Uh, this is just to give you an example. This was a study that looked at uh, different exercises and how much uh, activity that created in the gluteus medius, which we found was really the most important muscle to strengthen. So to start off, you know, when you don't want to overstress it, you may start off with something like a clamshell exercise um, or a lunge. Um, and that's going to give you some input to the gluteus medius, but not overdo it. Eventually, you want to do something like a single leg squat or one of these sideline exercises. And this just gives you an example of how we might progress somebody um, through a different exercise progression. And this is a study I did um, with 24 distance runners uh, who did have uh, IT band syndrome. And I looked at their hip strength uh, and compared it to their injured limb, uh, their non-injured limb, and also to a control group who didn't have this. And then their pre-rehabilitation uh, strength was then compared after they went through a six-week program, really focusing on strengthening uh, the gluteus medius, that prime hip abductor. And it was really pretty amazing. So uh, this is the, on the top, the females. And this is their strength before any rehabilitation. This is the males down here. And this is after putting them through that six-week program. And their strength returned uh, pretty close to the normal control group. And that correlated um, with getting them back with uh, yeah, so that was their, their hip and strength. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so this was their, their strength deficit before. This was their non-injured limb, and that was the control group. And then after the rehabilitation, they returned back into the normal range. And that was associated with 92% of them getting better within six weeks. Now, as we get runners back to running with this condition, it's a little bit different than some of the other injuries where we just sort of gradually build up their mileage and tell them to go out for a slow jog. For this condition, we actually tell the runners to start off with a faster running stride because the quicker turnover actually decreases that impingement I was talking about. Um, it keeps them out of that zone of impingement. Um, so once they can do that, then we'll, then we'll start to increase the distance. And we've been able to get runners back. They may not be able to go for a three-mile run yet, but if you're an 800-meter runner and we can get you doing some intervals on the track, we can get you back to doing what you need to do. And then, then gradually we'll get you back to the, the longer distance to build your endurance. Um, so that's just a little trick with this particular injury. Uh, moving down to leg injuries, um, the most common one is shin splints, and I'm sure everybody here has had that at one point in time. 
Um, another fancy word for it is medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, and most commonly, because it is on the, the inner or what we call the medial part of the tibial bone, the shin bone, very rarely it'll be on the outer uh, upper part. And these are some of the main risk factors. So female gender, a previous history of having had this condition, uh, being a more inexperienced runner. So I rarely will see this with the, the Stanford runners. It's usually more in the recreational runners or the high school runners who are just getting into the, to running. Um, if you are bigger, if you have increased body mass index, you're more prone to it. Um, and if you have increased pronation, or what's called navicular drop, uh, so if you're an overpronator, that might also be contributing. And there's a lot of treatments people uh, talk about. These are some that are, in the research, have been shown to at least be potentially effective. Uh, you can do what's called iontophoresis, which is a little bit of a steroid medicine that you can drive in with an electrical current. That's just a patch you can put on. Or phonophoresis, which is ultrasound with a little bit of corticosteroid cream, ice massage. But the thing that's probably been proven the most effective is called extracorporeal shockwave therapy. And, and we'll get into that uh, for some of the other injuries in the foot um, as to the mechanics behind that. Now, some of the things people are doing, but we don't really have research evidence for, um, so I can't really recommend, are low energy laser treatments, different stretching and strengthening exercises, compression stockings, leg braces, pulsed electromag electromagnetic fields. So you hear a lot about these things, but there's really not research to support them. So they may work for you individually, but when you look at the studies that are out there, we just don't have good evidence to support them yet. Um, the question with this, when somebody comes in with leg pain is, is it shin splints or are you starting to get a stress fracture? Shin splints, you, you know, you can work through it. Uh, if you're getting a stress fracture, you really need to rest. Um, and years ago, I really tried to understand this better and came up with a grading system from, different, from initial shin splint to different grades of what we call stress reaction in the bone to a full bone stress fracture. Uh, but the bottom line is if you're starting to get stress in the bone and not just around the bone, which would be a, more of a shin splint, you, you do need to rest. Now, that doesn't mean you need to stop activity. It just means you need to stop impact. So you can do something like deep water running. And if you do this with good form and really keep your cadence and get your heart rate up, you can really keep your conditioning. Uh, we've trained athletes just doing deep water running with major injuries right up to the Olympic trials with really good success. Um, the key, though, is it's a little boring. <laughs> and so you have to do something to stimulate yourself to get the heart rate up. So you, what you can do is like get a, some music. Uh, get like so it beats you know 70, 80, 90 revolutions per minute. Um, ideally, for a harder workout, you want to be at about 90 beats per minute. So each uh, you get you know your right leg is cycling at least 90 times per minute. Um, for a more recovery run, maybe 60. Um, and using one of these aqua joggers really helps because it helps uh, give you better pelvic position, so you don't have to fight the water as much. But keep in mind, when you're doing this, your heart rate doesn't need to get as high for the same aerobic workout. It can be about 10% lower than normally you would be when you're running on dry land, and you're still getting the same workload to your heart. That's just because when you're in the water, you have increased venous return because of the pressure, and so your heart rate won't get as hard, but your heart's still working as hard. The other thing uh, that we do a lot with our athletes is this is called an anti-gravity treadmill. And it actually will unweight your body. Um, and we can control it from 50% uh, body weight you know, up to full body weight. But it's a nice way to get somebody back running while we're still limiting the impact. Um, in fact, we just had a, a, what's called a run safe clinic today, like an injury prevention clinic that we bring in people a couple times a month. And I had a patient, he's got some hip arthritis. And uh, it's been hard for him to get back to his normal mileage. And I put him on one of these tonight, and he was just, oh, my God, because I haven't been pain-free like that in months. And so he's going to try and find one. He's all the way from Connecticut. He's going to try and find one back home 
that he can use to supplement his regular training so that he can keep his you know running mileage up there but not do the uh, stress to his, his hip. Now a few other things you can do to decrease stress to the tibia um, and um, one of them and this is from studies of patients who actually had tibial stress fractures found that the patients who developed tibial stress fractures tended to run with a stiffer knee. And so if you can run with a more relaxed knee, like something like chi running will teach that, um, it actually will decrease the impact force. So just to give you an idea, when you can land with a little bit more uh, hip movement, this is exaggerating it, but when you can let your hips bend a little bit more, your knees bend a little bit more, it helps your body absorb the shock. When you run very stiff and very upright, your body doesn't absorb shock well. And so that's going to lead to a lot of stress on your joints. So this idea is that just to learn to land a little bit more soft, uh, to let your body collapse in a controlled way, but so the, the, uh, the energy can basically just be dissipated throughout your body. It doesn't hit a hard, a hard uh, impact. Another thing is this, what we talked about before, is a four-foot strike pattern. And similar to decreasing uh, impact forces at the knee, it also can decrease the loading rate at, at the tibia bone. Um, so this may be something to think about. Um, now what we've found, though, is that as opposed to telling patients to think about uh, becoming four-foot strikers or mid-foot strikers, we tell them to just, an easier way we think to do it is to just think about increasing that cadence. So the ideal cadence that's talked about is, again, about that 90 revolutions per minute. And if you can increase your cadence, um, your body will naturally get to the foot strike that's best for your body. And for most people, that will definitely get you off the heel, onto the midfoot, maybe the forefoot. Um, but when you increase your cadence and just think about that, your body will kind of naturally do what it needs to do. We found if we just tell you to become a four-foot striker, and we're trying to study this a little more in, in the lab right now, but what we have noticed at least is that it, you, you then get other injuries because you're putting so much force on your forefoot and then it puts you coming with foot injuries or calf injuries. Uh, but if you just think about the cadence, your body will kind of figure out what to do. So you're not forcing it so much that way. Uh, moving down to the Achilles, um, this is the most common tendinopathy uh, injury in runners. Um, seven to nine annual incidents in top level runners. And this is one where males have much more of this than females. So 10 to one incidents. And a higher rate, uh, particularly in older athletes. What happens is that you get this thickened, often nodular tendon. So that thickness is, again, what we talked about, that disorganized kind of thickened scar tissue that I showed for the uh, hamstring. And so that tissue is going to be weaker than if it was nicely aligned collagen fibrils without all that scar tissue. And the key to treatment for this condition, again, it comes down to a, a strengthening exercise, is to eccentrically strengthen the Achilles. And there have been a lot of studies on this through the years now. And eccentric loading of the Achilles, um, and that, well, eccentric, again, what we're talking about is just the muscles lengthening as it's contracting. So if you do a calf raise, now your muscles, as you push up, your muscles shortening as it contracts. As you let the leg slowly lower, and particularly if you go negative below a step, now that Achilles is lengthening as it contracts. And so this lengthening part of it, that eccentric contraction, is associated with re resolution of these structural abnormalities, that tendon thickness. So the tendon will start to normalize and become uh, less thick. Um, but it can take a while. It can take often at least three months before you're going to see benefits with this. And you need to do the exercises every day. Yeah. Um, and 
even if you, by doing them every day, there have been no reports in the literature of, of rupturing your tendon from doing that. Now, if that doesn't work and you're still having problems, what can we offer you? And this is where that shockwave therapy I talked about can be helpful. Um, or you can actually use a nitroglycerin patch, the same thing we use for angina or chest pain. Shockwave therapy uh, is similar to what we have used for years with, um, if you have a kidney stone, kind of a high shockwave. It basically can help break up a kidney stone. But what we can do uh, in a very controlled way by doing that on tissue is you create like a micro trauma to the area and it brings in blood supply and that helps again. It's another way to stimulate your body's own healing. Because the problem with these chronic tendinopathies is that there's just not good blood supply. So if we can find a way to stimulate the blood supply with a kind of a micro trauma, or as we talked about before, this platelet rich plasma, we put your own blood in there, uh, to do it in a controlled way, it's, it's a way to stimulate your body's own natural healing. Um, there's high energy ones that, you know, we used to do similar to lithotripsy, but you have to go under general anesthesia for that. But there's now lower energy uh, units that can be used in the clinical setting um, that can be very effective. Uh, it's not painful. You can go about your day right after. In fact, we can do it for athletes in season and they can keep, keep doing the regular running. This was a study that looked at, uh, compared eccentric exercises versus the shockwave therapy and found that one or the other were both pretty comparable. If you combine them, uh, so you added the shockwave to the eccentric exercise, then the results were, were better than one by itself. Another thing you can think about are these nitro patches. And so what I'll do is I'll order a nitro, same nitroglycerin patch you would use for angina, but we cut it up into quarters. So you just use a quarter of the strength, and you put it on the area where you have that tendinopathy, and it's, again, it's a way it dilates the blood vessels. And it, it's another way to get blood flow in that area. Uh, you just have to be careful if you have a low blood pressure because if it, some of it gets into your system, it may actually lower your blood pressure enough where you're going to get headaches. Um, but other than that, I really haven't seen m many side effects from it. It doesn't cure you overnight, but it's another thing that over time might add to the treatment program. I'm going to skip over this. This is just a variant down at the heel. And uh, move on to plantar fasciitis. So how, how many people here have had that? Yeah. So, um, And you know, at least my experience is that you, you, know, you start to look through the literature on this, and, or you start to go on the web. And it's incredibly confusing what you should do for this. There's so many treatments out there, it's hard to make sense of it. Um, so last year, what I did is I actually went through all the different studies on, out there for plantar fasciitis and tried to group it into what made sense. So what had high evidence, medium evidence, low evidence, and what we didn't really have any evidence for. So in terms of initial treatments, things you might want to try right off the bat, this probably had the highest evidence, and it's simply stretching. But you have to keep in mind you want to stretch not just the Achilles, but the plantar fascia. And I'll, I'll show you a picture about how to do that. Um, and if you add massage, that gives you some added benefit. Just the massage by itself, though, only had low evidence. Uh, medium evidence is for some heel cushions or just an over-the-counter uh, 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 arch support. So that's a relatively inexpensive thing that you can try. Arch taping is something that I'll show you a picture of that you can learn to do on your own. Pretty simple to do. Uh, it's a way to support your arch with tape and you can keep it on all the time until you're better. Uh, and the evidence for that is, is pretty good, medium evidence. Interestingly, anti-inflammatories, the evidence for that was very low. So loading yourself up with you know, a lot of uh, Advil, Motrin, all those things may help a little bit. It's probably not, probably not worth the side effects or potential side effects. 
So this is a, a picture of stretching the plantar fascia. The key is you got to get those toes back. Um, so if you're just doing a typical Achilles stretch, that won't get it. But you've got to get your toes there uh, so they're being pulled back because the plantar fascia actually goes from your heel all the way to your toes. So you need to get those toes stretched back, and that'll put a stretch on the plantar fascia. And it's not enough to just do this a couple times a week, maybe even once a day. You've got to do this five times a day and hold it for at least 30 seconds. Um, and I, I'm telling you if, you, if you do that right off the bat, it'll cure you know, probably 80% of your symptoms. Uh, it seems simple, but it works. And then you can add some massage to that. You could also add some simple heel cushions or shoe inserts. Um, and then arch taping, I mean, it's something we can have our athletic trainers do, but it's really something you can learn to do on your own. They even sell kits now on the uh, internet, on, teach you how to do it on, on, you know, at home. But what, what if you've tried all those things and you're not getting better? So then what can you do? Um, so a corticosteroid injection, there's pretty high evidence that that's effective. Uh, you can do a night splint, uh, medium evidence, or even acupuncture. Um, and I've had a number of patients have told me it's helpful. Uh, the evidence is pretty low for that, but it might work for you individually, and there's no side effects, so maybe something to think about. A plantar fascia injection, um, you know, this... It's interesting because, for instance, the Achilles tendon will never inject because we're really worried about rupture. With the plantar fascia, the risk of rupture is much lower. Um, now, that's not to say what's without some risk. So the advantage of doing the steroid injection is you will get some pain relief, uh, so you'll be better off at one month. You may not be better off long term. In other words, if you just wait it out, you'll probably be the same whether you did the injection or not, but do you want to wait that long? So it might, might help you sort of get over the hurdle with this. There is a 10% risk of rupture, though, and that can potentially lead to chronic pain, so you need to keep that in mind. Now, we found, uh, again, by using an ultrasound machine, by being very selective where we're putting the needle, where we're putting the medication, um, I can't say we studied this, but we think that we're probably decreasing that potential risk of, of rupture. Um, night splint is something you can do too, particularly if you have that stiffness when you first get up in the morning, first few steps when you get out of bed, then it's worth wearing this at night because that's going to stretch that plantar fascia for eight hours. Um, it's a little uncomfortable to wear. <laughs> uh, if you have a partner in bed with you, they may not like it because <laughs> you're going to hit them. Um, but they have other things that are a little more comfortable too. You can get what's called a, a Strasburg sock, and they sell these in, in uh, some of the local running stores. Um, I know they have this uh, over at uh, Fleet Feet in Menlo Park that you can get. And when all else fails, uh, what else do you do? And this is again where shockwave therapy has really good evidence. Um, a custom orthotic, so something designed specifically for your foot, might be a reasonable thing to invest in at that point. And then this whole idea of the platelet-rich plasma. Uh, and again, there's just not great research studies yet for me to tell you uh, to go out and try that, um, but it might be something reasonable to consider. So the shockwave therapy is generally successful. It's better than a 70% chance of getting people better. Uh, not all the studies show, but overall it, it looks pretty good and the evidence is quite high. Uh, the advantage, there's no downtime for the athlete. You can do it in the office, no significant side effects. Uh, this is a custom orthotic. And I wouldn't jump to this, but if everything else is failing, it might be worth the investment. And then PRP, there was one study that compared PRP versus a corticosteroid injection. It looked like the results were pretty similar. Uh, there's no risk of the rupture with the PRP, so potentially that's a safer thing to do. Um, but it's not approved yet by the FDA, so insurance doesn't cover it. So does it make sense to 
you know, pay out of pocket for it. At this point, you know, I can't tell, I can't recommend it in this type of forum for you. Um, but just know it's out there. And just finally, I wanted to finish up with just a few exercises. If you want to, if you're feeling healthy and you just came here, say, okay, what can I do to just stay healthy to prevent these different injuries? So, for a hamstring injury, if you're going to, you know, just pick one exercise, I'd say pick an eccentric hamstring strengthening exercise to add to your, your workout routine. For patellofemoral pain, you want to do something to strengthen the hip abductors, the external rotators, the extensors. Um, squats are a great way to do that. Um, IT band syndrome, again, you want to strengthen the hip muscles. Uh, particularly the hip abductors, so something like a sideline leg lift to add uh, to, to doing your squats could be really good. Uh, and then I would also use the foam roll and stretches. For shin splints or other forms of stress injuries to the tibia, think about your gait modifications, so increasing your cadence, running with a more relaxed knee. And then for Achilles tendinopathy, Add some eccentric calf lowering exercises. And then for plantar fasciitis, something that we've been doing at Stanford for years uh, is just having the athletes run barefoot on the grass a couple times a week. Now, I'm not saying everyone should go out there and be a barefoot runner. I'm absolutely not saying that. Okay? But we do want to keep the foot muscles strong. And if you are always running in shoes, they may not be getting the work they need. And so if you really look at it, we've got a lot of different muscles in the foot. And so you've got to do something to, to work those muscles. If they get atrophied, then we're going to get problems like plantar fasciitis. And that's why we tend to see a lot more of this in our population than the, we'll see in other populations where people are walking barefoot more and they may play soccer or something barefoot. Um, that's why, you know, when we went to the playground and when my kids were real young, you know, first thing I want to do is take off their shoes. And my wife's like, no, 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 put on shoes. <laughs> Sorry, honey. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, no, no, it's keep them off. We want to develop their foot strength, you know. So, you know, to do it in a safe environment on sand, run on grass, I, you know, I'm not saying go out in the roads and do it. I don't want to be misquoted. Um, uh, but some barefoot activity is, is I think, helpful as prevention. So I know I went a little bit over, um, but there was a lot I wanted to cover. So hopefully we still have time for questions. Great. Yeah. Can you speak into the microphone? Or just speak oh, it'll, it'll pick oh, you'll up. repeat the question. So you, you went over a couple of things that were talking about increasing the blood flow to the area using some of those therapies or the PRP, and which kind of directly brings the blood to the, to the area or parts of the blood. So what about uh, heat therapies or other things that uh, would encourage more blood flow in the, in the region? You didn't mention anything about those. Do those provide any benefit in a similar fashion? Um, so yeah. please, please. so the, the question was whether um, heat therapy is another way to increase the blood flow to an area. Um, for most injuries, um, it doesn't go deep enough, the heating therapy. And in fact, sometimes it actually will create the opposite response. You, you get the heat in there, and then your body responds by actually constricting the blood vessels. So the studies haven't supported heat therapy as a way to really increase the blood flow into these chronic tendinopathies. So, yeah. Um, it's a way to just kind of loosen your muscles. It's probably good. It seems to be good for just you know, a tight muscle to f make it feel a little loose, but for these chronic tendon problems to get blood flow into that is really difficult. Yeah. Uh, what's the uh, evidence um, regarding PRP for Achilles problems, Achilles tendinosis? So the question is, what is the evidence for uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, for uh, Achilles tendinopathy? Um, the evidence isn't great. Um, in fact, there was a really big uh, article that was published, I believe it was in JAMA, um, that showed it didn't work. Now, there's a lot of critiques of that study and the way it was done. 
Um, but we still don't have a good randomized controlled study showing it works. Um, now, anecdotally, I've had some patients who've had it and they said it helped, but the evidence isn't as strong yet for that. So, um, you know, I'd say if you've tried everything else, you're not ready for surgery, it's probably worth trying, but I can't tell you that the evidence is there. So. You know, I, I, and people, he's not a plant, okay? Because you're, uh, it's a really, really good question because, I mean, the question is, I mean, I talk about strength in exercises, but, you know, how does that change your form just doing the exercise? Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and it doesn't, right? So we do have a program at Stanford. It's called Run Safe. And the idea is for injury prevention. And so we'll have you come in and we actually film you running. And, and really, that's the only way. I can't really tell in the office, even watching a walk. It isn't until people run that things come out that we wouldn't be able to identify. Um, and so that, that is the ideal way to do it, is to watch somebody run, to break it down, and to be able to correct their form that way. Um, it's just not a feasible thing to do and, you know, for everybody. So, yeah. Yeah, and if you you know if you have a coach or if you got you know somebody who's knowledgeable and can at least watch you or you know what to look for and you can do it in front of a mirror, definitely. Um, but yeah, that's breaking it down on a treadmill is is really the ideal way. So, and that's why we started that this program. Yeah, it's open to the community. Um, I think it's just i irunsafe.com. So and. I fell and injured the bursa on my elbow while running not too long ago. This PRP uh, approach, I'm considering how to, it's been a month now and the thing's not going away. Uh, and I'm wondering if that PRP approach would work for a bursa injury. Do you know? I, you know, so the question is whether a PRP uh, would work for what you're pointing to, the alacronom bursa. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. I popped it and it's not going away. I've been doing the recommended immobilizing things and splinting it and so on. It's not going away. So I'm, you, I'm considering surgery for it, but I don't want to do that. Have you tried a, a corticosteroid injection? Well, it was not at first recommended because of possible inf infection. Infection, right, yeah. Uh, and so I'm at that point now where I'm thinking about doing, trying that, or maybe I just heard about this PRP thing. Yeah, I don't think PRP, because what PRP do, does is it actually creates an inflammatory response. Okay, and I've already got that. And you've already got that, yeah. And so it creates an inflammatory response, and then your body brings in its own sort of anti-inflammatory mediators. So if you already have inflammation, I wouldn't recommend it for bursitis, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you go with the IT band syndrome. You're talking about stretching and foam mm -hmm. rolling and myofascial release. Is there any evidence on like some of the like graft in the scar tissue adhesion, like scraping, is that being effective on helping recover? Um, so you know we don't have like scientific evidence. There hasn't been a study, but um, you know I think all those are similar. So whether it's somebody who's really good at the myofascial technique, uh, you know, really skilled therapist using their hands, or whether they use some of the tools that Graston uses. Um, I think they, they give you a similar type of outcome, which is breaking up these fascial adhesions and ultimately uh, freeing up the tissue. Um, but I don't think one necessarily works better than the other. A lot of it is really the skill of the practitioner. I um, mean, just so they know what to look for, they're feeling the tissue properly. That fall is under the same category as my, the myofascial release. It really does, approach. yeah, yeah, because we use them interchangeably. So I have a pretty
pretty screwed up foot. And uh, I've had perennial tendonitis for months. And I also notice when I go downstairs, for example, my foot tends to flop. I don't have much strength in my forefoot, and I have trouble pushing off. So two-part question. One is, is the treatment plan for peroneal tendonitis similar to the other ones you mentioned? Yeah, so the, the question was, is uh, the treatment for perineal tendonitis, uh, which is one of the tendons on the outside of your foot, similar to some of the other things, it's similar in the sense that um, ultimately you want to try and get the tendon stronger. The exercises would be different because that helps bring your foot out. So you want to do what some strength exercise for your everters that rotate your foot out. Um, some of the other things we talked about for chronic tendon problems, um, there's not studies specifically for that, um, but it, you know, it might be worth considering if you're not better and you're not ready for surgery. Okay. Yeah. The other part of the question is, you kind of piqued my interest when you were talking about the Achilles and straightening the Achilles, and I'm wondering if some of the issues that I'm having with going downstairs, for example, or not having enough strength to really land properly in the Achilles problem. You know, very well might be the one way. To, so the question is, uh, how do you know if it's an Achilles problem uh, that's contributing? One simple thing you can do is just try doing some toe raises up and down, and that's you're going to really work your Achilles. Which I have trouble doing on my foot. And yeah, so if you have trouble doing that, uh, then you know the Achilles has to be involved. Yeah. And so the same strengthening exercises. Yeah, but but you know. Ease into them, because you don't want to start with the eccentric, because that is pretty demanding. So start with just the concentric raising up. Mm -hmm. Once you can do that, then, then start the, the eccentric. Okay. So, okay. Um, what are the pros and cons on three types of landing, toes, heel, middle, with respect to the knee impact? So if I understand the question correctly, uh, what is the uh, result of a heel uh, landing midfoot or forefoot on knee. Right. And um, which, one, which one is preferred if there are any preferences? Yeah, I mean, it looks like a, a forefoot landing is going to put less stress on the knee. It's, yeah. So if you had to choose, um, that, that's, the studies do support that. Yeah. One more. Um, when you do the gait training, have you found that there's any benefit to different shoe material being soft or firm, heel up or zero drop, as they say? Oh, yeah. So the question is, you know, does shoe material, uh, cushion shoe, stability shoe, motion control, <coughs> the type of material, does that, does that influence things? Yeah, and that's part of what we evaluate in, in our Run Safe program. So we actually have four stations. One's look at your shoes, your foot mechanics, film you at gait, look at your strength, flexibility. We even have nutrition. Because the foot, you have to look at that. Because, you know, not everybody should be in a minimalist shoe. It depends on your foot type, how you absorb shock. Uh, some people will do fine in, you know, a shoe with no support. Some people need a lot of support. Some people need an orthotic. So it's very individual, and it really depends on your foot structure um, and, and how your body responds to, to shock. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's no, like, universal answer to that. Yeah. No, no, because that, that's where people come in and get injured is that they hear, oh, I should become a barefoot runner, and I should get in a minimal shoe, and... And they try it, and then they come in, and they're injured, and we realize, no, you know, for you, that might not be the right choice. Um, or maybe you did it too quickly. Or, um, but, yeah, it's, you really, it's very individual. And that's where going to a shoe store uh, that's very knowledgeable can help you. Um, or, you know, just having a coach or having somebody watch you. Wondering um, why there's not more talk about the sort of like flexibility of the shoe. 
Uh, I don't more talk about it. So the question is, in, with minimalist shoes, there's different types of minimalist shoes. Yeah. Oh right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think they're trying to uh, accommodate to different needs within the minimalist shoe. Some people do need more support. Some people don't need any support. Um, but some people just need a shoe that's got some more buildup that's not falls out of the minimalist category too. So I think it's just I think what you're saying is that even within the minimalist shoe category, there are subcategories that you need to look at. You can't just group them all together. And yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah, thanks. I think that's probably all we have time for today. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Thank you. Thank thanks. You.